Hey guys, John Loxley here, back with our bonus episode for Narcosis, right? Uh, so as you can see here on the screen, this is Hell or High Water surviving Oceanova. Right, so this is uh, part of the anniversary DLC that was released for Narcosis. Uh, if you have Narcosis now, it should have been automatically updated. Uh, I believe there's an option in the launcher when you first launch the game. Alternatively, you can right-click on the uh, the name of Narcosis in your Steam directory, in the actual Steam library itself, and there's a DLC folder and a, a PDF with this. So this is the actual book, as I understand it, written by uh, Kip Mattis. Matt Kip Mattis, I think that's the name. Um, and I'm going to read it to you guys. So if you want, you can read along with me. If not, you can listen. And worst case scenario, you can just uh, mute the mute the audio and just uh, read the book as I go through it. Uh, if you're curious about what the background is here in the wait, can you even see my uh, my mouse? There we go. Uh, if you want to know what the background is, just real facts. Let me see if I can. Uh... There's Manny. There's Manny. Being a crazy cat. All right, so Hell or High Water surviving Oceanova. Um, I'm going to take breaks as I need, um, especially to refill my beer. Uh, but here we go a haunting and poignant high point in the tradition of timeless true life survival stories. Hannah Wu, open air. Hmm. Kipling Kip Mattis with Alex Bayman and Alessandro Filari. Now, also, uh, some of the DLC was that um, that open air interview. I don't know if that was added to the main game or if just the audio files were added to the DLC. I'm not entirely sure. Possibly both. So we're going to kind of scroll a little bit from Honor Code. Um, I kind of like how they did this, actually. It's it's kind of neat to have, like, background materials, but I'm actually curious which was written first. Uh, so if you're familiar with the uh, the movie The Abyss, uh, James Cameron, you know, director of Terminator, Terminator 2, Avatar, other stuff, he actually, there's a book, um, and he had the book written before he started filming the movie itself, right? So... He basically wrote the script, gave the script to an author. He was like, hey, make a book out of this. And then he had the actors read the book and kind of flesh out their um, their motivations and stuff. So he was like, oh, this is my character's background. So it, it kind of worked a bit in reverse um, for Virgil, the one that died. Okay, all of this. Now, I don't know if you can see. Can you see right here? Oh, it's off the screen. This is actually 70 pages long, um, but I don't know how long it'll actually take because we're on page like seven already. But to be fair, this is like an actual, I just skimming through, it's like an actual book. So I don't know how long this is going to be. I expect it'll be longer than the, uh, just listening to the open air interview was about half an hour. This I expect to be probably an hour, so we'll see. I'll take breaks. I'll I'll chop it if it chop it up if needs be. Um, but uh, but yeah. So let's let's read on. I've made it big enough. I think that you guys should be able to read along uh, with me if you choose, and even that is better. There we go. That's a little bit better. Can I just use the arrow keys? Okay. Uh, preface, this is an account of February 2nd, 2021, and the impact it has had on my life. In the years since the Oceanova disaster, I've come to feel the need to share details from that fateful day. I've been approached many times about the events that transpired and asked, why didn't you just wait for help? Or why not just take the sub to the surface? I understand where they're coming from. In our culture, we often take a detached perspective and treat others without tact. But things weren't so simple down there. So even if I'm not the best suited for the job, the responsible thing is to put it all on the page. I recognize that my story is both alluring and lurid, and I've done my best to deliver it fairly. 
but I hope you'll forgive me for occasionally delving into the history and science of deep sea exploration and the intermittent description of day-to-day -day life in the HAB, dull as it might have, been some, might have sometimes been. In doing so, I hope that I can share with you the importance of our work. We all believed in what we were doing. And even before that terrible day, few have been pushed to the extremes my colleagues and I were, daily. And for that, all 20 members of the Oceanova Project deserve to have their stories told. So even if I do them no justice, I owe them that. I owe them at least that. Kipling Kip Mattis. It's a bit, um, it doesn't flow properly. But that's okay. You know, I respect them for even going and do an actual book, right? I don't know if you can hear the clicks. Yeah, you can. I mean, it's not showing up on the sound bar, but, but uh, definitely, definitely you can. Mm. I believe I'm drinking Juicy Haze, <clears throat> which is awesome. It's a New England Pale Ale. I think it's a New England Pale Ale. That's the hazy, the haziness. All right, forward. February 14th, I was going to say 12th, but that's not correct. Uh, 2022. Mr. Mattis first reached out to me in the spring of 2021, writing about the introduction, about writing the introduction to this book. He was apologetic and clearly apprehensive, and in return, I wasn't particularly polite. I didn't let him finish before I declined. In his first email to me, he laid out his plans for this book about the human cost of surviving unthinkable circumstances. My response was raw. The idea offended me. He survived. No one else had. I told him I couldn't imagine any acceptable justification for forcing the true survivors to relive the trauma of losing their loved ones all over again. The true survivors, right? I won't bring up that quote about uh, the real victims of combat or the wives the people and the daughters, the ones that lose their husbands and sons to war, those are the real victims. I saw only selfish motives, catharsis and profit. What's wrong with catharsis? I was angry at the universe for taking Cora, and Mr. Mattis was the most tangible target for my wrath. Despite our terse encounter and my clear refusal to contribute, a copy of the completed manuscript arrived in the mail a few weeks later. The book sat unopened on the small table in the entryway for almost a month. One night, emboldened by several glasses of scotch, I tore through the plain brown wrapping. I approved the scotch. I read through the night, and the next morning called Mr. Mattis back. I had misjudged him, on his motives and as a man. His vision, as it turned out, had been spot on. During a long, oftentimes emotional call, we talked about Cora and our plans for the future, amongst many other things. By the end, I'd reconsidered, agreeing to write the words you're reading now. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So what did he write that led me to change my mind? The short answer has to do with the realization that in some instances and events in life, there are no answers, nor even absolution. Sometimes there's only acceptance and forgiveness. Also the, uh, the face cam, right? I, I talked about it earlier in the, uh, the playthrough. And, uh, I don't know, I thought about doing without it, but at least this way I get to directly address you guys, you know, like, cause it's not, it's not necessarily taking away from the, uh, experience itself. Ooh, that's kicking in already. That's good. It's like, I think 8.9% or something like that. It's up there. Okay, I remember the summer before Cora got involved with Oceanova. We were both between jobs. One of those rare periods of adulthood when you can simply sit and enjoy looking at the horizon because nothing loomed there. Lazy breakfasts followed by long walks. The kind of conversations you can only have with the one who completes you. I loved the downtime, but I could tell it quickly made her antsy. It wasn't ambition exactly. I like the scroll wheel better. Uh, it wasn't ambition exactly, though she had plenty of that. Cora just didn't feel complete unless she was figuring something out. So when she got the call from Avril Aquanautics, we both knew she had to go. Dr. Cora Vandero was the light in my darkness and the love of my life. She was incredibly smart, full of purpose, and always trying to find a better way. She joined Oceanova because she truly believed in what it would mean for the future of the environment and for the children we looked forward to having. Were she still with us, 
I have no doubt she'd still be inspiring others and working her hardest to make the world a better place. Forever losing what's most important to you makes you rethink everything. Even now, <clears throat> even now, I still struggle to put life back into focus, to feel the sun on my face. I still miss Cora and won't ever stop. Wounds like this never really heal. But what Mr. Mattis has written honors her, their colleagues, with brutal honesty and utter respect. Caitlin Sitko. Did you notice that? No agenda pushing. I approve. Also, lesbians are hot. <laughs> uh, uh, I half kid, right? Mm. All right. Let me scroll up. I want to know how each, how long each chapter is. Oh, it doesn't say. There's no page numbers. I mean, of course, right? That's all right. What is the... Uh, I think this is Russian or something. It, this, it, it's not made by American developers. It's made by um, other, other people. I want to say Russia, but maybe that's not correct. Can I find out? Um... <laughs> Don't play honor code. Tell me about honor code. Mm -hmm. Okay, that doesn't doesn't really help media videos safe and dry yeah i guess we did find that i it's not um mentions right 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 it doesn't i was trying to find out about them themselves franco californian hmm Okay, well, there you go. <clears throat> I don't know why I thought Russian, but uh, I guess French and Californian. Who knows? All right, make sure you can see this properly again. Make sure it moves properly. Okay, once in a lifetime. Before I go back to the beginning, you need to know just how desperate I was. One thing I've learned over the years, and especially from the events after Oceanova, is that we're all too eager to cast judgment over others. I've done it myself, reading stories like this one, about men and women forced to make a choice, THE choice, perhaps, and then promptly second-guessing them. How could they do that? From the comfort and safety of our homes, we're sure we could do better. You had to be there in that titanium suit, in that frame of mind, to understand why I had to leave Dr. Cora van der Rohe at the bottom of the sea. Right, she was the one. So before I did this, I just went through um, Oceanova, or not Oceanova, Narcosis again, and got all the achievements, made sure I got all the little collectibles and stuff. I followed a guide, of course. Um, Cora van der Rohe, she was the one that was just sitting in the middle of that place after the lava caves. Um, so I guess we're going to find out the true story of what happened. Um, it's easy enough to point a finger while clutching your pearls, sitting in some office or cafe, swiping the hours away on your phone. I know how it sounds. And I knew at the time just how hard it would be, which is what made those moments so cruel. It was less than 90 minutes after the crash. So much mangled steel and titanium. The screech of metal grinding metal still rang in my ears. We were stuck in a stupor, mostly struggling to believe we were still alive. That the two of us, where before there were three, had survived. Right, the third was the dad, I believe. Senior Castillo. Mm. I'm going to have to break here in a minute and get another beer. But i got to maybe pace myself. <clears throat> We were located in the South Pacific Ocean in a region referred to as Point Nemo, 
or less colorfully, as the oceanic pole of inaccessibility. As implied, it's the area furthest from land and the hardest to reach. Point Nemo, of course, is reference to Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea about an aquanaut's journey to uncharted depths. And though it took over a century to get caught up, we felt we were a part of a long line of explorers helping to make those stories a reality. For each of us, it had all the trimmings of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The goal was to bring a crew of scientists and engineers together to safely harvest the raw and crystallized form of methane gas, burning ice, as it's called. Though methane hydrate on its own is harmful to the environment, the processes we were using was clean, minimizing the release of greenhouse gases and making it safe to use for vehicles and other resources were top priorities. Morally or financially, it's the right thing to do. Can't we um make like diapers for cows or something? I mean, I understand that's not uh you know, cows supposedly are one of the largest sources of methane gas. I don't know how you'd collect it, all the cow farts, but uh who knows? Of course, this is all public. <laughs> Uh, of course, this is this is all public knowledge. Cow farts. Not exactly news, but I feel obliged to mention it here. Even today, amidst all the wonders of technology and science, people are still easily mystified, and the greatest tragedy of all would be to forget we were down there in the first place. Whether I wanted to believe it or not, the doctor died with JB back in the sub. Um, the doctor... Which one was the doctor? I thought he was the one in the gym. Anyway. Oh, no, no, no. He's talking about Vandero. Okay, I get it now. Uh, the doctor died with JB back in the sub during our transit to the escape pod in Compass 2, only in a delayed fashion. Uh, okay, hang on. Let me reread that. And escape pod. But they weren't going to Compass 2. They were going back to Compass 1 from Compass 2, right? Trying to find the other survivors. Um, her diving suit was damaged in the crash. We didn't realize she was living on borrowed time. Up until she staggered down into the sediment beneath our feet, I assumed we all would, because I couldn't bear the alternative. I know my limits and take care not to test them, but she was pushed too far past her own. After several minutes of trying to coax some coherence out of her and seeing the lights from her suit fade, assumption gave way to fact. I would have to leave her. So that was, a uh, like oxygen deprivation? Or maybe hypothermia? For all its elasticity, the human mind can only stretch so far before it breaks. I can safely say I know that as well as anyone. But here I am, able, to, able enough to write about it. I'm here because I put one foot in front of the other over and over, driven by the belief that I just might make it out alive. I told myself I might find someone, that we might return together, help her, bring her back to reality. But in truth, I had no idea whether I'd find anyone or not. I just did whatever it took my legs moving. Had I stayed, I'd have slipped into the same mental abyss. She was too far gone, and there was nothing I could do. So, hmm. So maybe she just broke down. If only we hadn't been forced to evacuate the sub. Well, broke down and the suit was damaged in some way. If only we hadn't been forced to evacuate the sub, we would have done the proper checks on the suits. But I can't really blame either of us for operating on pure panic. The water was rushing in, the sirens were blaring, and JB's screams echoed through the crippled hull. So, no blame in this regard, only the lingering notion that, that things been just a bit different. She might be writing the foreword to this book. Better yet, I'd be writing the foreword to hers. Mm -hmm. By the way, the sub was like ripped in half. <clears throat> I won't imagine, I won't ask you to imagine that moment. You can't. That feeling as if your life could end just around the bend, or over the next ridge. One such moment will rattle you to the core. 
Imagine what it does to a man's nerves when stretched thin over the course of hours. I did what I had to to survive. If you don't think that's what she'd have wanted, then you don't know Cora Vandero. For as much flack as I've received for being the relentless pragmatist, she far exceeded me in that regard. That's not to say she wasn't sympathetic. Rather, she was simply clinical and methodical, habitually calculating and completely, deeply devoted to what we were doing. I imagine that's how a career like hers conditioned her to be, even if it wasn't already in her nature. Oceanova didn't create exceptional people like Cora, but thanks to its brutal NASA-style selection process, it was remarkably efficient at finding them. She would have understood. Had I been the one to break down in that black, barren place, she wouldn't have lingered half as long as I did. That's not to say it wouldn't have pained her. Rather, rather, she'd have done the math in a lot less time, concluded I was beyond saving, and ripped that emotional bandage clean off, rather than letting it fester. I can't possibly convey what it felt like, watching such a strong mind, uniquely suited to making the most difficult of choices, wilt and then crumble. Like the divorce of a couple you knew would grew old and die together. To witness it unfolding was both shocking and steeped in sorrow. Though now, I believe I understand what she was going through. With JB's death only an hour before and innumerable challenges betting us at a return, the odds were bleak at best. It's a hell of a thing to see someone suffer and feel so powerless to help. Atmospheric diving suits are strong and resilient, heavy by necessity, but clumsy by default. Simply walking was a challenge, and falling over would be cause for serious alarm. There's only so much you can do to help when someone's that far gone. So I had to leave her, sealed up in that shell. To be perfectly honest, it was over for her the moment we stepped out of the wrecked sub. But for me to keep such a secret, even if it was mine to keep, would have undermined from the start any eventual attempt to make my peace and rebuild my life. It's important you know what happened, as it happened, and that I did everything humanly possible to save Dr. Cora van der Rohe and the others that day. I'm still feeling the emotion from the game. Mm. So in that regard, good job. Good job, Debs. Number two, only safe haven. What is our time? I, uh, I still agonize over what might have what I might have done differently had we not been caught unprepared. When disaster sweeps you up in a current of chaos, everything you know to be true becomes a blur. I was in my room after a 12-hour shift. Wrapped up in the covers, oblivious in dreams, the wailing alarms and hull reverberations intruded into my subconscious. I was reliving a distant, languid summer road trip, driving through a sun-dappled stretch of woods, Mile markers passing ad nauseum, 61, 62. I woke gasping for air, soaked and clutching the sheets. A steady drip of water was coming through the panel of microfissure in the ceiling and onto the bed. I've been matching the rhythm in my slumber, mile by mile, drop by drop, but by 70, I was wide awake. Wiping the water from my face, I sat up in my bunk, plunging bare feet into several inches of agonizingly cold seawater. Although barely audible at first, I could make out panic shouting echoing through my room. The relentless wailing of alarms made it impossible to tell whether they were coming over the PA or from right outside. Beyond that was the low but unmistakable roar of Mother Nature, hammering away at the hull. Still wearing the orange Oceanova jumpsuit I'd fallen asleep in, I carefully moved through the door. Under that kind of pressure, there's no such thing as a harmless leak. The sign of any water inside the habitat made my guts churn. I knew what it forecast. After all, flooding tops the list at the bottom of the sea. The living quarters of Compass One, the habitat which I currently call home, were adjacent to the research labs and the facility for processing methane hydrate. That the corridor was empty wasn't entirely surprising. With a crew of just 20, each with overlapping schedules, only a few of the bunks were ever occupied at any one time. Although every sense screamed otherwise, I hoped I was experiencing some kind of fever dream. Sloshing through frigid water and floating debris, I made my way to a nearby terminal and opened the Habitat's diagnostic app. One hand on the touchpad, the other pressed against the trembling wall, I did my best to process the flurry of information on the terminal, which was in turn scrambling to keep up with the rapidly unfolding damage. 
I frantically swiped through alerts, warnings, and other bad news, and the readouts revealed the source of the disturbance. Shockwaves had struck the habitat not long before I'd woken up. Unfortunately, this terminal's app was only capable of determining the location and nature of all our problems, not to pinpoint what caused them or whether more were incoming. The structure had been weakened just enough to let the water in. No single, no single stab wound then, rather death by a thousand cuts. Crippled, but not crushed. There was still time to escape, the thinnest of silver linings. The others would be racing to evacuate. The logical thing to do was join them. I swiped through earlier log entries, but found nothing. Whatever happened had happened recently, and was just getting started. An event of such swift, uncompromising brutality can only be understood after the fact when there's time, if nothing else, to think. In the hours that followed the sound and fury of the first few minutes, I certainly had plenty to reconsider what I'd done, what I'd not done, and what I might have done differently. Now those feel like wasted moments. We had the training and tools and were qualified as anyone to survive this. Most contingencies you can plan for, but it's the ones you can't that matter most. Mm. It's called a risk stratification. <clears throat> the ones that are, um, you know, critical that have the worst effect you plan the most for, even if they're minimal. There's a thing I simply think of as the list. It's how I've always dealt with the intricacies of life, personal and professional. It's how I cope, how I find calm in the chaos, my only safe haven. In preparing for Ocean Over, of course, there were other lists to mind. Check your gear, trust your training, is one of the first things you learn. But the second they fail, you fall back on what you know best. For me, it's the list, only this time it wrote itself. Keep breathing, find others, get to the surface. Hmm. Wow. We're on page 15 out of 70. We still have a bit to go. I am almost out of beer, though. Let's see if we can get through number three, and then we'll probably take a break. Or at least I'll take a break. You know, if it works out to be an hour, I'll stitch the episodes together. Uh, the first face I saw was weathered, deeply tanned, and reassuring. John Bernardo Castillo was our dive master. Lean but powerfully built with a modest pot belly, charming and friendly with bright teeth and perpetual mid grin. JB comprised one half of what we all called the Castillo brothers. His counterpart, John John or JJ, was in fact his son rather than a sibling. Not that you'd have ever guessed it, their fraternal similarities were far more than skin deep. Both brought a much needed buoyancy to life in the hab, quick to laugh or to make others laugh, irreverent, informal, but never irascible. And while their easygoing natures might have struck some as unprofessional or even reckless, that couldn't be further from the truth. Those of us who'd made the cut had been poked and prodded on every possible level before being pronounced fit to live and work in such a perpetually and literally high-pressure setting. The Castillo brothers were part of the EVA team. Mm. Maybe water next. This is actually drying my throat out more than I thought. The term was borrowed from the astronaut's handbook. It stands for extravehicular activity, anything requiring a special suit to survive. In our case, that meant ADS. <clears throat> uh, in, in our case, that meant an ADS or atmospheric diving suit. Unlike conventional diving gear, pressure is kept out entirely. A standard dry suit excludes water but does not resist pressure. A wetsuit does neither. Not unlike an anthropomorphic submarine, the ADS's joints permit the diver's limbs to move without compromising the integrity of the seal. Movements, thrusters, flares, and other key functions were operated by thumb controls to allow for ease of use. When first described to us, it sounded a little like we were going to be stuck inside human-shaped cars, an unsettling image. While the entire crew had extensive training in neutral buoyancy pools on the surface, as well as numerous shifts in the field, the four members of the EVA team, the Castillo brothers, Virgin Phi, Fail, Phi? Probably Phi, because he's French. And Isra Benyamina suited up daily for what they called babysitting. It was an apt term. When it came to sea walks, those four made the rest of us look like we were still learning to stand upright. Right, because Kip is not a diver. He's like a manager or something, right? 
Um, with JB's easygoing attitude and professional expertise in mind, you can imagine how unsettling it was to see the man so clearly rattled. The look in his eyes drove home the reality. Some of us weren't making it out and up to the surface. He was worried, not just for us, but for the others as well. I struggled to make out his exact words over the sirens, but could only catch a few key words. Specifically, something about the life pods. The structure of the habitat groaned loudly around us, deforming subtly but clearly before our eyes. The hallway contorted like an accordion in slow motion. We both tensed, frozen in place as an irregular series of water jets punched through the walls in rapid succession and with astonishing force. When I'm asked about the moment when I knew things were bad, that bad, my mind always goes back to that moment, realizing our home beneath the sea was violent, violently transforming into a crumpled soda can. The failure states for a titanium habitat under two miles of seawater are limited, to say the least. Either implosion occurs immediately, in which case you'd never know what hits you, or the hull is weakened enough to admit seawater through its fissures. In an ambient pressure habitat, where the air inside is the same pressure as the outside water, that's not quite as catastrophic. The same doesn't hold true in a single atmosphere habitat. With such a high pressure differential, not only does water fill the interior near completely, any water passing through the fissures is pressurized enough to, call addi to cause additional damage. Our problems were stacking up, and in retrospect, we haven't even considered the more obvious ones. Beyond the immediate threats of drowning or shock induced by near-freezing water was the looming possibility of imploding at any moment. We'd all been well-trained in the safe, orderly evacuation of a structurally compromised habitat. But like those airplane pamphlets, so much song and dance. In the end, if the plane goes down, there's not much you can actually do except make your peace. And I think it was um, <clears throat> anywhere from three to 5,000 pounds per square inch that the water pressure's at. I mean, I don't even imagine 5,000 pounds. Like, what is that? Two and a half tons? Like a couple cars, maybe like a big truck put on a you know, a tent spike on your arm or anywhere, like that's kind of what you're, what you're looking at. Like it would just, that's the water. It would like punch straight through you, which blows my mind to think about, right? Gingerly, we moved away from the fissures spitting out water. I imagine so. As we regained our footing, Dr. Van der Rohe rounded the corner, pale pageboy cut hair matted to her face, lugging a bright red iron ratchet that looked to be half her size. One of the more even-tempered and clinical members of the crew, her Dutch accent conveyed class and sophistication. She was a fitness buff, but the life aquatic can wear down your body and spirit in equal measure, and she looked to be struggling with the tool in her hands. It wasn't immediately clear what she intended to use the tool for, but I found out soon enough. The three of us had passed through the pressure door in the bulkhead separating the living quarters from the rest of the structure. She intended to seal off the crew quarters, slowing the spread of seawater. Someone could still be in there, JB screamed. He had a point. In all the chaos of the past few minutes, I hadn't stopped to check the rooms for anyone else. I couldn't shake the image of someone passed out in their bed or lying face down in the frigid water, knocked out by falling debris. But before JB could wrest the tool from my grip, our companion assured us we were the only ones in the living quarters. An impossible call, but necessary. Looking back, it's easy to see we were right in sealing the door. There was no time for the step-by-step -step approach. Still, in the moment, it seemed unimaginably harsh. The door closed with a resounding whump, followed by a protracted hiss as the pneumatic seal did its job. With at least some of the sirens muffled by the door, the din had diminished to the point where we no longer had to shout. The doctor stepped away as I unsocketed the ratchet from the door. Clearly unable to shake the thought that someone might have been left behind, JB did little to hide his concern. His face was inches from mine, my eyes daring him to continue. The sooner you stop second-guessing us, the sooner we can get out. There's others, yes, but not back there. The doctor stabbed a finger at the door behind him. I'm trying to remember, I, I don't think we, we didn't find anybody in the, the dorms. 
JB looked startled, not having seen that side of her before. He took one last look back at the door, as if he was sure that at any moment we'd hear someone banging on the other side. It's done. Time to go. Dr. Vanderow stood a few feet from the door, eyeing the two of us. But what more could be said? JB slammed a palm against the door and strode off down the corridor, unlaced work boots sloshing through the water. As the doctor turned to follow, I sagged against the wall, absorbing reality one layer at a time. The muffled siren in the distance. Water showering down and rising at my feet. First at my ankles, then past my calves. There was no time to ponder the situation. I had to follow. Just rereading the, the paragraph just to make sure I didn't miss anything. As it turned out, the doctor was right. We were the only ones in the living quarters when the pressure door was closed. However, during post-mortem investigations, they found that one of the crew members had attempted to re-enter the hab via one of the many shafts that snaked through the lab. It was Uzor Stella, one of the floor hands and among the youngest of the crew. He'd been outside wearing an ADS, and the trek he took to get back in must have taken a great effort and a lot of time. They found him stuck behind a gate in the tunnel, but by that point, we'd already left Compass 1 behind. Even if he'd made it past the grating, he still would have been trapped inside the module we'd just sealed. It's not for me to say, but neither option seems better than the other. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was dead. I mean, he was dead, obviously, but... So he was trying to get back to Compass 1, which is uh, per the protocols. And then... Uh... But he tried to get in through one of the side ways, I guess. <clears throat> Waiting through the partly flooded hallways was gruelingly slow and awkward, but I finally caught up to the others. I found them standing in the module with the life pod. Though there was only one, it was equipped to carry eight passengers. More than enough space, so naturally my thoughts drifted to the other crew members. I'd half expected to find someone here, prepping the pod for launch, but somehow knew this wouldn't be the case even before we'd arrived. So is this the evac pod or the submarine? Who knows? Because they're in Compass 1 at the moment. JB looked... Jesus Christ, it's already at 40 minutes about... JB looked distracted, consumed in thought as he stood by the pod. Sheets of paper floated at his feet. One of, these, one of these he had pressed to his face, an incongruous image left to my mind. Leapt to my mind, some long ago television commercial, where a cheerful housewife holds a dryer sheet, wistfully absorbing its scent. As I approached, he let it slip from his hands, leaving us to drift and mingle with the others. The doctor then emerged from the shadows in the corner, and with a small but succinct shake of her head, my stomach sank. The pod was inoperable. The structure groaned all around us, protesting its wounds like some great beast in its final agonizing moments. Okay, so presumably... Presumably this is the evac pod in number one. But we found it, and there's a dead body by it. I don't remember. Maybe, okay, let's try and do this one. Uh, number four, from the outside. And I'm out of beer now. I'm out of beer. Okay, well, we'll, uh, how long is this? Hang on, we're on 19. Oh, okay, yeah, let's, let's finish this chapter. That's only a couple of pages. In the pod room, the doctor and JB argued over the next course of action. The alarms were still going off, and they wouldn't subside till the place was completely flooded. Despite the commotion, I was contemplating my list from earlier. I had a handle on the first two steps, but the third had already become frustrating to accomplish. Structural damage from the force of the shockwave had crippled the mechanics of the life pod's launch capabilities along the module it was housed in. Have you ever seen what happens when you fire a gun with a bent barrel? That's basically what would have happened if we tried to launch the pod. The others continued to argue, intensity rising with each passing moment. Sensing it was about to boil over, I stepped up and presented a solution. The cargo sub. That's still docked, right? The doctor immediately shook her head at the idea. We can't use it to reach the surface. It's automated. Even if we could override the software, there are no physical controls. And redundant safeties prevent rigging it to... Before she could continue, 
I interrupted her and clarified I didn't mean to ride it to the surface, but to take us to Compass 1. How do they get to the surface, anyway? Because there's evac pods, but... But how do you get to the surface? Could you not... Because they were in a sub. You'd think you could just take the sub to the surface. I mean, there's, there, there should be more than just evac pods, right? Anyway. Uh, I didn't mean to ride it to the surface, but take us to Compass 2. I stressed further that the nearby extractor field, which had been moved close to Compass 2, also had some crew scheduled for work that day, and they might be in need of rescue. Some of the crew were working out there when the shockwave hit. It's far enough away that they wouldn't have caught the brunt of it. They might, might not even know what's happened. JB grimaced from the corner, but said nothing. The extractor fields were various mining locations around the two halves. After taking all that we could from one, we'd move on to the next site and prep the whole process again. At the time of the disaster, we had six, successfully depleted six methane ice deposits. Although we relied on mining bots and their heavy drill heads for all the real work, the Castillos, Virgil, and Isra were there to establish prospective sites before the work could be done. It was by far the most inventive, or intensive, and nerve-wracking work to be done, as it required the EVA team to venture away from the habitat. Also, those pipes are huge. We wound up putting it to a vote. Dr. Van Der Rohe came down on my side, but JB still needed persuading. He was cagey throughout the voting process. I got the sense he wanted to avoid going to the extractor fields entirely. Given that he'd been there many times with the EVA team, I assumed he'd make the voting unanimous. I challenged him, but he glared at me once more. Wouldn't his son be out there? Right? I mean, we found the sun at Compass 2. Yeah, because chapter 10. Sensing tension spiking again, the doctor, stopped, the doctor stepped in, pointing out we were running short on time. She also sensed that JB was apprehensive about leaving for the fields, but reminded him of the delicate nature of a seawalk. We couldn't have used the cargo sub like a car, as it was automated. We'd have to stop at one of the designated stops, Compass 1, Extractor Field, Compass 2, for instance. Travel on foot to the field, bring back anyone to the submersible. JB knew this, the ADS being like a second skin to him, and babysitting us engineers and lab geeks, oh, okay, he's an engineer, was what the diving team did best. She continued on. Besides, she added, as one of the core members of the EVA team, you're the most qualified to guide us through, especially given the chance we may find more survivors. JB relented, and I resolved to let her be the voice of reason going forward. With a multi-billion dollar high-tech habitat collapsing around us by the second, we couldn't afford to turn on each other. In un uneasy agreement, we made our way towards the docking bay. Just before we left, Cora went to the monitor by the door and patched into the PA system. During an emergency situation, it was part of a protocol. It was a part of protocol to get a message out to the other crew members before making an escape or taking other important actions. Despite the alarms, she was still able to get something out. This is Dr. Van Der Rohe. If you receive this message and are still in Compass 1, we are leaving in 15 minutes for Compass 2. The life pod in Compass 1 is inoperable. I repeat, Compass 1 life pod is inoperable. We will head to Compass 2 in 15 minutes. Come to the docking terminal immediately. We didn't hear that one. We heard one with like five minutes to go. She was unable to set it for a repeat, so she relayed the message once more. Afterwards, we left the wrecked pod room and entered the next. If the pod room was the place for putting your hopes to rest, then the next room was where our struggles truly began. It was a long corridor, a total mess of mangled supports and cables. Despite how tense things had been in the previous room, I would have gladly suffered another standoff with JP, or JB, over hazardous debris that littered this hall. With fountains of icy cold seawater issuing forth from burst pipes and severed electrical cables sparking off and hanging perilously close to the water, we all silently debated whether this was the best course of action after all. Though no one said it, we all knew the hull could crumple at any moment. With each hatch we opened, a mild current of seawater poured from the next module into ours. It felt like a ridiculously elaborate obstacle course, almost too bizarre to be real. Elements from the outside imposing themselves with increasing relentlessness, like a shark pursuing the scent of fresh blood. Also, it's important to remember they don't have their suits yet. 
they're just in their clothes. I was making my way closer to the end of the hull when a large and heavy mass under the water caught my foot. As I stumbled, I caught a glimpse of burnt cloth and seared flesh. I knew before scrambling to my knees that it was a body. When I glanced down, the signature orange jumpsuit confirmed my fears. It was one of her colleagues, Dr. Pallavi Metal Kincaid. The awful smell of burning flat fat made an already horrible worse. I had just seen this woman a few hours ago. I heard JB muttering, mutter something. Dr. Cora replied, it was certainly possible. I asked her what he'd said. Methane. He says he's leak it's leaking in. I think I smell it too. We've been thoroughly, thoroughly drilled on the fact that in an enclosed atmosphere, even a small amount of methane could cause dizziness and impaired coordination and judgment. Ironic, considering that we were down there for the wholesale collection of the stuff for use on the surface. I told her I felt fine, physically anyway. One of her characteristically curt remarks cut me off. Happy to hear it, before she elaborated further. That's not the problem. If it reacts with the remaining oxygen in the habitat... She didn't need to finish. In a reaction, flash fire would quick course quickly through any modules not yet full of seawater. If sufficiently weakened by the ignition, the hull would collapse soon after. It was quite the dilemma. Implode first or explode. Either way, we'd be pressure cooked. Being burned alive would just be a bonus. Yeah, I would assume the fire would then uh, drop the pressure in the, uh, in the air, right? So it would further the collapse. So it wouldn't be exploding per se. It would be you burn to death or, well, chances are you'd probably inhale and inhale all the fire and you'd sear your lungs and then you can't breathe anymore. So you pass out. You'd probably pass out before you died, at least. That's the positive. Uh, you know what? Let me stop here. At least for now. Um, good so far. It's a good little book. And we're at uh, we're at about forty seven minutes. So, um, I'm debating whether I want to read more and just stitch it to this one, or um, do like a multi part thing. Because we're about twenty two out of seventy, so we're about a third of the way through it. So it's potentially another hour and a half uh that said if you guys made it this far thanks for your attention uh thanks for your thanks for watching and your your time and attention and stuff i hope you enjoyed this it's interesting um i don't know if it's anywhere else out there but if you do have narcosis it is in the dlc folder so you can read it on your own or you can just you know watch this episode and the next ones where i will read it with my voice <laughs> I was going to say my awesome voice, but, uh, you know, that's up for, up for debate, up for debate. I'm just glad the cats aren't trying to, to, uh, get across here and, and rub their face into the mouse. Uh, but regardless, I hope to see you guys next time until then guys take care.